good morning, good afternoon, um, and good evening, wherever you are, depending on where you are in the world. Um, thank you for coming along to this workshop on how to use Transcribus and through it take advantage of the UCL Toronto Transcribus model for the automated transcription of medieval Latin manuscripts. My name is Tim Causer of the Bentham Project, which is based in University College London's Faculty of Laws. Um, the Bentham Project was founded in 1959 to produce the new scholarly edition of the collected works of Jeremy Bentham. But since 2010, we've been involved in some um, various digital humanities initiatives. At first, through our uh, award-winning trans crowdsourced transcription initiative, Transcribe Bentham, and second, through our involvement in two pan-European consortia of computer scientists, archives and information professionals, and humanities scholars, um, which develop solutions for the automated searching, indexing, and full text transcription of handwritten manuscripts uh, using handwritten text recognition and various other technologies. And these two consortia, which ran the Transcriptorium program in 2013 and 2015, to 2015, I should say, and its successor, Retrieval and Enrichment of Archival Documents, or the READ program, were responsible for the product development and production of the wonderful Transcribus client, um, the management of which is overseen by the University of Innsbruck and the READ Co-op. Since 2019, though, we, led by my colleague, Dr. Chris Riley, who you'll hear from shortly, um, have also been working with the Documents of Early England Dataset Project at the University of Toronto, led by Professor Michael Gervers, who's also here this tonight. Um, to investigate how improvements might be made to their experiments with Transcribus um, on medieval Latin manuscripts. Um, at an event this time last week, we heard about some of the remarkable results that Chris, Ariella and the rest of the team have um, had in refining and developing their HTR model. And today you'll be run through a step-by-step -step guide on how to use Transcribus and to, to get at the, uh, the, the new model. For your convenience, the um, event is being recorded and will be the link will be distributed to you tomorrow through uh, Eventbrite. And if you do have any questions for our speakers, please do enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen um, at any time and we'll deal with them um, at the end of the presentations. So just to introduce you to our two speakers this evening, um, in order of appearance, Dr. Chris Riley completed his doctorate at the Bentham Project in 2018 on the subject of Bentham's use of history and has published his research in the Journal of Legal History and the American Journal of Legal History. He's currently co-editing the final volumes of Bentham's correspondence and has been involved in the Bentham's work um, on HTR since 2015 and is a, a highly experienced Transcribus user. Our second speaker is Dr. Ariella Elema, who is a legal historian and archivist. Um, she received her PhD from the University of Toronto's Centre for Medieval Studies, where she studied Latin paleography and wrote her dissertation on trial by combat. In 2018, she earned a master's degree in library information science and now works in archives as well as consulting on projects in legal history. So without any further ado, I will hand over to Chris to, to get the ball rolling. It's uh, all yours, Chris. That's great, thank you, Tim. Um, let me just share my slides. Oh, Tim, it says host disabled participants being sharing, you might have to upgrade my status slightly. That's great. Um, okay. So yeah, hi everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Chris, as Tim kindly explained in his introduction. Uh, so I've been a transcribus user for quite a few years now, so, um, relatively. Um, initially, my involvement with the program kind of meant assisting. Um, in the bit of an administrative capacity at first at the Bentham project in the development of a HDR model to, to read the handwriting of Jeremy Bentham. And, and this was later followed by funding being awarded for um, the UCL the University of Toronto collaboration, uh, which is why we're here. And the aim of which was to develop another HDR model this time to process uh, medieval Latin manuscripts, particularly those containing plenty of abbreviations as well as to host last week's model launch event, and thanks to those who attended that, and then um, to also host this week's workshop. Um, so in last week's session, to very quickly recap, we discussed 
transcribe Bentham, the running of which is now my primary responsibility. Um, and Tim described how that particular project led to the Bentham project's involvement with Reed and with Transcribus. And um, by far one of, well, at least to me, one of the most impressive outcomes of this is the uh, the creation of an online keyword spotting tool or the PRHLT engine, which you can see here on the, the bottom the, the bottom two pictures on this slide. And this allows users to search the entire corpus of Bentham papers at UCL and the British Library um, for keywords and phrases, even though not all of it is transcribed. I will come back to keyword spotting later, but this is kind of an example of, the, of what this kind of project leads to. And then the, the image above is from Transcribe Bentham, which is um, what kind of letters here. And um, we also discussed um, Deeds Research Project at the University of Toronto, uh, and as Tim pointed out, it stands for the Documents of Early England Dataset, and this was established by um, Professor Gervers in 1975. Um, we also talked about the early attempts of, Helen to, of producing these, uh, a Deeds HTR model, before I proceed to talk about the, the collaborative efforts leading up to creation of our seventh and, and what is now the latest model and that's publicly available from transcribers for everyone to use on their own manuscript material. So yes, I'm going to show you how to use the software and uh, in general and then how to use our model in particular. So in terms of just the aims of today's session, it's kind of to teach new and beginner users how to use transcribers to upload and process manuscript material, how to train and use HDR models, including the one developed during the uh, UCL and Toronto collaborative project. Um, if you're a more advanced and intermediate user, um, you'll probably derive some benefit from the session, I hope, but if you've used the software program before to create and apply your own models, um, and then I, I might explain some things that you already know, but um, hopefully not to such a great, uh, huge extent. Um, so with that out of the way, in today's session, we'll be covering the following. Um, so installation and account setup, credits, importing documents and creating collections, um, baselines and text regions, adding text, uh, adding tags to your text, um, creating models, using those models, um, searching and keyword spotting, analyzing your results, uh, exporting your results, uh, and then I'll provide some useful links and resources before we'll um, open up the floor for some questions if there are any. So yes, without further ado, I'll we'll move on to um, account setup and installation. So to begin, you'll need to visit the Transcribers website, and some of you may already be familiar with, the link for which can be seen at the top of the slide and just register for, uh, register for a free account. Once you've registered, um, you can then sign in, and then once you're signed in, you can download, um, download the program itself via chosen operating system, which um, and it currently supports Windows, Mac, or Linux. Um, once it's downloaded, um, you can unzip, extract, or mount your files depending on what operating system you're using. Certainly in, on Windows, it's a, a zip file that, that, you, that you receive. Um, put that in a location of your choice, and then just run run the transcribers application files on Windows 10. You can see it's just here on the, on the top, top right. So transcribers now requires credits to use some of its various functions, including uh, model creation and use. Um, new users are automatically granted 500 credits for free when they register. Uh, and these are visible on the credit screen and that's accessible via the, the collections button uh, on the left-hand side. Um, but more can be purchased in different size packages through um, the credits page on the Transcribers website. Precisely how many of these credits you'll need can be calculated on this page, as depends on whether you want to use HDR or Pylea technology, which is more, which is more recent, and the latter being a um, slightly different way to process your material with a very similar kind of workflow of, of how you get your results. But yes, the, the 500 free credits you receive is, is more than enough to um, experiment with a few existing models or to create one of your own and hopefully to determine whether or not the use of the platform would be, would be beneficial to, to your research project. And credits can be shared between users and across collections, depending on which package you select. And there are concessions available for students, teachers, and members of the read co-op, but you can find all that information on the link shown um, on the bottom left of the slide here. So yeah, to get into the more serious things um, of collecting, uh, sorry, creating collections and importing documents. 
So to start uploading your own material to Transcribus, just click the server tab at the top left of the application and then click the collections button. Um, from here, you can click, um, click create um, and enter the name of your uh, enter the name of your new collection. In the document ingest upload panel, which is the one on the top right hand side, and um, which you can also access by pressing the um, the import button on the top toolbar when you first come on Transcubus, it's just a a picture of a folder with a, a green left leftward facing arrow. Um, you can then select the type of upload you would like to perform and locate your files and then and then press upload. Um, use the highest quality images you have available, um, the ideal being sort of high quality TIFF files if you have them, but you can also use PNG files, JPEGs, PDFs, or you can even use the, the doc scan app uh, to take images of your own. Um, when it's been created, the collection can then be selected using the collections button again. From here, you are also able to, to rename the collection, add or remove users who might also wish to work on it, delete it entirely, or select another existing collection of yours to work on. Um, if you wish to add additional pages to your collection once it's been created, visit the, uh, the document manager panel. Um, and this can be accessed by pressing the, the symbol featuring a, it's a like sort of a little folder with a spanner across it under the server tab. Um, here you can click the, the collection name followed by, by the plus symbol on the right where it says add new pages. And here you can also delete pages, alter their status, uh, reorganize their ordering and see which pages to which you've, um, you've added text or not added text and how many lines on each. Yeah if you have added it. In terms of the next step, you'll need to add baselines and text regions to your, to your document. Um, baselines being the lines under each line of text, so that you can see it very faintly in blue here. And then the text regions being the larger green boxes, which kind of surround more substantial areas of text, like uh, paragraphs or sometimes uh, whole pages. So on the tools tab, you can see it clear here and um, select current page, or you can select um, a page range. So you can do the whole collection in one, in one go and then leave find text regions selected and then simply just press run. Um, you can check the progress of this process by uh, checking the coffee cup icon, which is this jobs icon here. Hopefully you can see my cursor okay. Um, and this, this, is just, this is the same for, for sort of many of the other processes that just give us we running, you can check on the status here. Um, so while this layout analysis tool is extremely useful for automatically generating these lines for you, the results are sometimes inaccurate in some places and might need to be tidied up slightly. Um, and to do this, you just go through the documents in your collection to which you've added baselines and text regions and um, just check for any inaccuracies. So for instance, there might be some marks on the page. So on the light left hand side of the screenshot, so the uh, kind of this facing verso might have been highlighted with a, a text region or some baselines might have been placed there. And if you don't want to include those in your um, in your, uh, your ground truth and your transcript for this, this folio, you can simply um, you can simply just go through and, and delete them. And to do that, you can just um, left click and hit the delete key. If you want to draw some new ones, I've included a little screenshot of this, some of the, the, of the bits of the toolbar on the side. So to draw new text regions, use the TR button, new lines, new baselines. Um, they are also, you can't really see it in this image, but the lines are generally kind of select, um, separated into little nodes. So they, they don't run entirely straight. It'll try and follow kind of the curvature of the line. So to see these just press um, if you just click the line, it will show you the little nodes. These can be adjusted um, upwards or downwards so that the baseline um, matches the general trajectory, just so it kind of sits directly under the line, so it has the best chance of, of processing it correctly in the future. Or you can um, add new nodes or just delete nodes here, which is uh, which is a very helpful tool when uh, going through this, this little process. Once you've done that for your for the collection that you've uploaded, the next step is to uh, to add your text. 
So you can begin to add your text to your manuscripts in order to create your, your overall ground truth by going through each manuscript page in this collection line by line and just copying and pasting from a document or set of documents containing your transcripts into Transcribus itself. Uh, to speed up the process, you can use the text to image matching tool. It's very, very faint, but you can even see it here under other tools, under the tools tab. Um, second option down under other tools. Um, and that requires kind of creating a batch of, uh, of files of each folio separated into, into lines with the, the line breaks in the correct locations. Um, I won't go into too much more detail on that, but you, there's, there's more info on, on the link here to, uh, about text to image matching. And I generally prefer to do the, the old fashioned way, but it'd probably be quicker like that. So you, um, while you're going through and adding your text, if you come across a word that's separated, um, it's split over two lines. To denote this, you use the, the little angle dash symbol. I've highlighted that in red here. Um, so that's on the little, it's on the toolbar, which will be underneath um, underneath the text input panel here. Or if you're, I'm not sure about other kind of international key sets, but certainly on my keyboard, on a UK style keyboard, I can simply press tab. Uh, sorry, shift and then the key above the like the tilt key and that, that inserts the same kind of character. There's also a little, if you can also see this little keyboard icon, you can press this and that has various other, um, for many, many more, more kind of special characters that you can put in there. Um, but yes, for, for a line, a line break and um, mid, mid word, that's what you need to use. Um, when you've completed adding your text to all the folios in your collection, or sorry, just for this, sorry, just for one folio, you can um, you just set your, uh, set the pages correct, containing the correct version of the text to, the, to ground truth at the top kind of status bar. Um, this can be done en masse if you go back to the document manager, which I mentioned previously, um, which is just underneath the um, like collections tab, if you can see a screenshot of it. Um, but yes, if you go back there, you can then um, mark them all as, as your ground truth. But this, you don't kind of have to do this, but it's very useful when you, you come to the um, using the advanced text comparison tool, which I'll go into a bit later. At this phase, you can also um, apply tags to your text to demote, denote certain manuscript features. So Transcribus allows you to enrich your text with a variety of different tags in order to add these and um, simply highlight the word or space um, that you wish to tag, uh, right click and then navigate to all tags here and see the various different, different ones you can apply. So you can add one or several tags to the word or space in question to signify that it's uh, an abbreviation, that it's reading is unclear, that this is a misspelling or perhaps an addition or a gap in the text and, and so forth. Um, you can also see uh, and add a comment section here, um, which might be particularly useful if there are multiple users working on uh, working on a certain collection or whatever other reason you might add a comment to some text. Um, it's also worth noting that these are completely searchable, but I'll go through um, searching when I talk about key searching in keyword spotting a little bit a little bit later. Um, in terms of tagging in last week's session, if you were in attendance, I discussed how we used a, a third party find and replace tool called a Brev Solver to apply a large number of abbreviation tags uh, in batches. Um, I won't go into too much detail about it. It's a little bit fiddly and, and the original version, only, only the original version, which processes just one page at a time is on and currently on GitHub. Um, but if you'd like to give it a try, drop me an email and um, hopefully help out uh, in some way. Um, so moving on to model creation. By default, if you're a new user, your version of Transcribus will not have its model training function enabled. So this button here with the bicep, I don't think it will appear. Um, so it's just to get it enabled, you send an email to uh, email at transcribus.eu, you can see it's at the top of the slide, um, and they will quickly be able to be able to enable that for you. So once this has been done on your behalf, um, on the tools tab, underneath uh, text recognition, so in here, 
um, just post train. And here you may give your model, um, I'm not sure how clear that is, but um, here you can give your model a name, um, a big description. Um, and then that's usually used to provide some details about the type of manuscripts material used to generate the model, including um, what time period they're from, what archival collection they're from, and so forth, as well as the name of your project if you have one, followed by uh, the language or languages of your material in the language field in the top right corner. Uh, if your model is later made publicly available, all of these details will um, help to guide other users to your model if it meets their, their general requirements and, and yields good uh, character error rates. At this point, you'll need to set the number of epochs, um, and that's this, this field here. Um, or in other words, the, the number of, uh, my understanding is that the number of times the service will process your designated batch of material to create your model. So the default value for this is, is set at 50, but a higher figure is, is generally recommended um, because time permitting. So we've achieved some very good results by setting this as high as kind of 400. Though a slightly lower one might be preferred if you wanted to, to, to speed up uh, things a little bit. We've then got the, the option to choose a, a base model, and that's just underneath the epochs, epochs field. And this will either be a, uh, an existing publicly available model that you've identified as having been created with materials similar to your own, a private one that has been shared with you, um, or it might be an earlier model that you've already created yourself but wish to use as a foundation for your latest one. And this can be left blank though, if, if you don't want to use a base model at all. Um, so then you select the material which will make up your train and your validation set. You can see this bit at the bottom. So it'll list, I've actually got the wrong tab selected there. So the, the default will be documents on the side and that will essentially show your, your collection and um, or collections, um, which I think you can then expand and then just separate it up by by individual pages. So the train set is sort of the, the bulk of your images and transcripts from which you wish to create your model. Um, and then the, the validation set is, is, a, is a smaller allocation on which TestCubus will perform its, its testing. And you can select, you can either select the latter, so the, the validation set manually, um, just by highlighting the whatever you'd like to use and then pressing the validation button here. Or it, it's a new feature compared to, relatively speaking, compared to um, my first use it, but um, you can now do it automatically. So you can allocate a 2%, 5%, or 10% um, allocation um, validation set, which is which is really useful. Um, I went with 10%, but I haven't experimented with a different percentage. So you can, if you would like to do that, you can have a fit around. So once this has been done, you can click OK, um, and then just leave leave it to work its magic, basically. It can take quite a long time. Some of our models to create took um, uh, 11 to 12 hours or so. And this is kind of what you're looking at for a large model with a, a large amount of manuscript material. I'm sure some people have achieved for all numbers of hours. Um, so yeah, I've historically kind of left it running overnight but you can check at any time the, the, the coffee cup symbol, which I mentioned before, the jobs button, uh, and that will tell you the progress. It will kind of give you, um, it will also give you some preview percentages of how well it's doing, as well as its overall, its overall progress. And you will also get an email as well when it's, a Transcubus will send you an email when it's completed, so you don't have to sit at your desk the whole time. So that was, um, model creation in order to kind of select and use a model um, you need to go to the the text recognition section under the tools tab um, and then press the run button so you can see it here um, you then define the got to so yeah you next want to define your uh, your page range on this text recognition panel I probably got these in the wrong order. I think the one on the left should probably have appeared. The one on the right should have appeared as the one on the left, because this is the one you'll see first. 
Um, I would uh, tick do polygon simplification and then leave enable keyword spotting. Um, then just find your, your new model on the list or select an existing one, which you can select HTL model and then this will, this will appear. Um, so yeah, this, this will display the, the various names, the projects, the languages, who created it and the technology used in the creation when they were, when they were made. Um, and also show kind of the number of words in total that, it com that comprises it and the, uh, the number of lines, a learning curve, a um, bit of a visual, um, yeah, visual key to, the, to how it ran when it, when it was created. Um, and it will also show, most importantly, the, the character error rate on the train set and then the character error rate on the validation set. And these are um, kind of one, of the, one of the main things you'll be looking for. And basically, the, the, lower, the lower these are, the better. Um, at this point, you can opt to use um, a language model, which is composed either of uh, an existing dictionary file, um, of which a, a very large number are readily available. You can see some on the, on the side of this very large scroll to show you the, the length of the list. Um, or you can set it to um, language model from training data, and that will draw information instead from the transcript used to create the model itself. Um, and if you wish to do neither, you can um, just leave it as none as it is as it is on this little screenshot there. And lastly, just press OK and then leave it to finish running. It will take a little while. Um, precisely how long will depend on the size of the collection that you've um, that you've told it to, to run itself on. Um, although it doesn't take anywhere near as long as, as modern creation. Um, Again, while it's running, you can check its status using the coffee cup icon, which I keep mentioning. And once the model has been run, just give us will prompt you to, to reload the page so you'll know when it's, when it's going to be completed anyway. And once, once it's been run, you can switch backwards and forwards between um, the model generated transcript and your original transcript. By, uh, there's a show versions button on the top toolbar in the main menu. And it, it just looks like a stack. Um, a stack of three pieces of paper and here it will show you kind of your original transcript and then any um any other versions that you've um, kind of the output of when you've run other models um so a bit more of a closer close-up screenshot of that section is from our model which you mentioned a few times now um and yeah here's some of the figures so 140 thousand words um 9,780 lines, we did use 400 epochs, that figure that I mentioned before, and then the character error rates on the train set and validation sets, um, 1.39 and then 0 0.80 respectively. Um, so yeah, if you would like to use our model, you can just look for look for this name. If you, you can also filter, so if you go into the list of models, you could you just type UCL in there, it'll show you, um, ours might even show the Panther model. Um, so yeah, and if you do use it, please let us know. We'd be very grateful to hear if you've um, had any successes with it, or if you um, have any feedback. That would be very grateful. That's what it's that's what it's there for. But yeah, essentially, what you're what you're looking for here in your own in your own models that you've created, or an existing model which would you would like to use on your own manuscripts, are the character error rates on the train and validation sets that are uh, as low as possible. Um, the general benchmark is kind of around 10% that we, that we look, look for. Uh, and then a learning curve, a learning curve more generally, or preferably kind of um, come into a point on the, on the right-hand side. In terms of you know, getting your results and seeing how well, um, well or otherwise your model is done on your material, um, you need to sort of first make sure, at least for the advanced compare, Function which I'll, which I'll mention. Make sure that your um, your original transcripts are set to ground truth. Had a few problems if you if you don't do that, but you can always use the simple comparison. Or if you forgot to do this and you want to do this, just you can just go back to the document manager, and then as I said before, you can alter the status of your pages to um, to ground truth kind of on mass. Um, then 
can then use this through two basic comparison tools sort of the, uh, the basic compare and advanced compare. For the former, the, the standard compare tool set the reference text um, to your um, completed and checked transcript with your tidy baselines. Um, and then the hypothesis text will be the more recent. Um, and you'll say, yeah, uh, CIT lab, HDR, and then the name of the model that you ran and when the, the time and date that you ran it. Um, so, and then, yes, yeah, simply click. Uh, click compare and then the the word error rate the character error rate and the the word error rate for the folio selected will display in the box uh, below uh, just under here you can see that i've done one and um, and these these represent the accuracy of transcripts in reading individual characters and um whole words respectively so character error word error rate um, so if you and if you run this like sort of several times in different folios, they will all appear in a big list. So you could and um, you could sort of technically do it this way and then work out an average for the whole lot, or you could um, use the advanced compare tool, which does uh, multiple folios. And to do this, you just set the type to uh, HDR, choose the page range on which you would like to do the textual comparison, and select the hypothesis by tool name option. Um, to, um, to the name of the last run model, so it will look very similar to how this looks here. Uh, and then just simply press compare. Um, and yeah, this takes a little bit longer because it's, you, you're processing more results. But when they when they do display, they'll display in the same location. And then um, the character error rates and the word error rates will be an average for the for the whole lot. So um, as long as you've kind of the first kind of few steps, this, this is kind of much more useful than going through each and every page and um, to find out your, your word error rates and character error rates. And let's see if you go back to the main screen, so this top left screenshot on the on the tools tab, um, you can click you can click compare text versions, and that will display this version comparator tool, um, which is very, very handy. Um, and that will show the incorrectly generated text in highlighted in red and struck through and then what it should have been according to the um original grant uh, the original transcript that you created um so it's kind of this is what it's done wrong this is what it ought to have been so forth and then you can kind of use this to to help to determine where your models work well and where they, they work not so well um which you can aim to address if you decide to create a follow-up model or two So yeah, I tease this a little bit, but um, searching in, in keyword spotting um, to open the, this search for panel, um, you can simply press Control and F like you would on a web browser or Word or Excel or something. Um, or I haven't mentioned it on the slide, but you can also uh, press the binoculars icon on the top toolbar, which is just next to the next to the coffee cup. And you can do various things here and denote by these little tabs. Um, and the most useful of which would be if you want to search the full text, um, if you would for words and phrases, um, and that's either sort of transcribed or HDR generated text, um, you simply kind of select which collections you wish to include and whether or not you want the search to be case sensitive, and then just press search and it will come up with any, with any results in, in below. I mentioned tags a little bit earlier. If you want to search your transcribed text for any tags that a collection or page contains, as mentioned earlier, and um, use the tags tab, which lets you look for a specific word that's been tagged as abbreviated, unclear, in addition, a gap that's been noted as search, and, and so forth. Um, for the keyword spotting tool, just select the KWS tab, which I have highlighted and then enter the, the keyword or words which you wish to search under queries and determine whether or not you would like the search to be case sensitive um, and partial matches and so forth. It also has this confidence slider at the bottom it's set to 0 0.05 on my little screenshot um, but this allows you to set a value between 0 0.01 and 0 0.99 with the higher the number being the greater the level of confidence that the software has uh, the, the word that is found is the correct one 
Um, I generally say to, to set this around halfway to begin with before adjusting it higher or lower, depending on the search results. And at the beginning of the presentation, I showed you the, the screenshot of the Bentham keyword spotting tool, and this is um, it's kind of functioning identical, but offer it operates within Transcribus rather than having its own kind of discrete online interface. Um, if I just get back to the beginning, you're going to see the um, the confidence threshold is kind of here, but it um, doesn't have the decimal place. Um, and it also allows you kind of double click a word and it will give you a percentage of what, what it thinks it might be, which is which is really, really impressive. Um, let me go back to my next slide. And um, so, yeah, as I said, this is one of the most impressive parts of Transcribus and that it allows users to search for words or uh, in sets of manuscripts for which they might not have originally had transcripts, instead using model training data to make educated guesses about the appearance of a word or phrase with varying levels of confidence. And if you wanted to try this out, try the, the, the Bentham Papers Keyword Spotting Tool, which has um, also has a link at the bottom of the page to kind of related projects that also have a similar um, similar platform if you weren't too interested in Bentham, but you were interested in kind of transfer records or, or such like, which I'm sure many of you are. And yeah, the the better that the most the better and more successful the HTR model you have used is for the collection in question, so and the better fit it is, the more reliable will be your your results with the, the keywords button tool, which um, kind of applies to most things really. Um, can I try into a bit of close the to export? Um, once you've kind of done some one or some of the things above, you can export your data to your home computer in, in a variety of formats. To do this, you just simply click the um, this, this icon at the top. So yeah, there's the binoculars I spoke about before. So that's the, the, the export key here. Um, and this will open this um, document export, export document panel. And then you want to go to the client export tab um, and select either the current um, to the current document for the currently loaded folio or current collection for multiple documents and then um, this this side on the right hand side here and then select your desired export format so you can do it in the transcribers document pdf you can export your tei uh, a word document or a text document etc um, check that your version status is selected is, is the is the correct version because you might have multiple if you've run various different models and um, so just check that that's the the one that you want to actually export and then just simply press, press OK. Um, also if you wanted the um, the XML data um, the way of doing it is on the back to the main menu screen. I'm not sure if I have a I'm not really taking my screenshots in a particularly great way because I could um, I don't think I have one of the, no, just by the way, it's very simple to, it's just, it looks like a, um, uh, one second. Oh, it's the, it looks like an unrolled scroll, just like a piece of paper, basically, and the opens transcript source, and then you can kind of copy and paste that if you did want the, on the XML data. Um, and then it's, it's between the, the show versions button and the, and the selection mode button. So that's how you um, yeah, upload material, create some collections, create a model or use someone else's model and get some results and compare them, um, search them, the material and the, the subsequent HDR transcripts and then to export, export your results. So that's kind of um, hopefully a good overview to, to, to get you going if you haven't used the program before. Um, Finally, here are a few kind of useful links and, and resources regarding transcribers that might be that might be very useful to you. Um, the resource center on, on the left of Wiki uh, contains a wealth of information on all aspects of the use of the software program, including some of its more complex features, which I'm not, not covered today. Um, transcribers platform on Facebook um, is a very active community of users where you might be able to find um, help or an answer to a specific question if one should arise through your, the course of your research. Um, the Read YouTube channel, again, is very good. Um, it's kind of video tutorials or uh, recordings of past conference papers and, and things like that. 
And that's the JavaScript as light, which is very new, which is um, quite new. I haven't actually used it personally yet, which is why today's session was based on uh, the, um, the standard downloadable client. But it does look very good, especially um, if you're a user who wants to give transcripts a go on a shared computer or didn't necessarily want to download some software. So a, a shared computer like an unlibrary or an archive environment would be um, kind of perfect for that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, hopefully that's a, a kind of decent overview. Um, I think my colleagues and I will take some questions. Hopefully they, whatever it was, the pop music doesn't kick back in. But yes, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. That's that's great. Um, I can see we've already had a, quite a few questions in for you and Ariella, which I'll, I'll run through in order in which they came. Um, first one from Jan Ostrachilic. Um, how do you deal with initials? I think in one of the slides there was a line where there was a big R for Robertus on the baseline, despite doubled in size. How did we deal with right. that? Uh, I can answer that. Yeah, we... Um... We, uh, when there's a, a large initial uh, at the beginning of a line, uh, you can adjust the, the baselines. You can drag the baselines around a little bit so that they, they kind of go around the initial. If the initial is too large and it touches a number of other lines, sometimes what we just had to do for our model was, uh, was to just cut that word out of the model entirely. Um, we haven't quite found a, a great solution for that yet. Um, I think that this one might be for you as well, Ariella, from uh, Michael Engel. How does the software tackle Latin abbreviations and other features available, AI features available, which offer possible ways of opening abbreviations? Uh, Chris may be able to, to speak to, to some of the, the AI solutions, um, but um, as I described in, in the talk last week, uh, Transcribus is capable of handling a lot of the, uh, the symbols in, uh, in Latin uh, manuscripts. It's able to, uh, uh, for instance, all the, the symbols for per and pro and, and pri, uh, it can distinguish those and simply expand it on its own. So you don't need to, to come up with a special character set for the, the transcription for your model. Um, and some of the uh, abbreviations that were uh, that were more complex, where uh, a very short abbreviation is actually expands into a very large word, we had to <coughs> especially tag and um, kind of go through the model and um, and tag those as, as abbreviations that needed to be expanded. Well, thank you. That's that's perfect. Um... A question from William here. I think this one might be for you, Chris. Um, he, he's looking for an existing model, uh, presumably looking for a similar hand in the same language, but how much does the, the document type matter? So I presume if it's, say, like a legal document as compared to family correspondence, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, as long as the handwriting is kind of loosely similar, um, the same kind of language, um, not drastically different um, penmanship, then it should actually be reasonably fine. In terms of kind of types of documents, I mean, we've used it on quite a few different um, different forms, so it, it usually does quite well. And um, it's hard to kind of give it a general rule of, uh, of that, but yeah, it's what you're looking for in, in choosing a model, as I kind of mentioned, is the um, making sure it's the correct language, so it's sort of a similar period, and then um, yeah, sometimes you can contact the people who made the model to try and find out a bit more details about the range of the range of hands and, and um, kind of graphical styles and things. But yeah, that's that's kind of it. Yeah, because some of the descriptions are more uh, full than others, I think. Yeah, I think I think we're in the process of finding out just how well each of the models matches uh, each kind of correspondence. So you know, if you find out something new, <laughs> write to us and tell us. Yeah, it's a trial and error. Is involved. Um, another question from Jan. Um, is it possible to omit words tagged with a special tag from the model training? Um, I'm not quite sure to be honest. We may have to refer that one to the 
the transcribus authorities. Yeah, they might be able to help more. I mean, I mean, I I, I don't know the the place I would look would be in um, when you come to train a model when you allocate your um, training set and your validation set. You can also use existing models, but I don't know whether there's an option in there. That that would probably be the place for it, but I'm, I'm not sure if that's currently possible. Um, another question from Jan, um, how do you deal with interpunction? I'm looking at the text, it seems to me that you simply skip all inter interpunction from the manuscripts, is, is that right? Uh, yes, yes, we omitted all the, uh, all the punctuation and interpunction from the, uh, the transcripts. So yeah, if, if you're creating a, uh, an edited version of the, the text, you'll have to add that back in. Um, three questions from Yelda Mesifoglu. Um, what is the difference between a line and a baseline? Um, as I understand it, the line is the sort of segmented text that we see and understand as a line, and whereas the baseline is the um, goes along the base of the characters of the line, so the machine can read it. I think that's the distinction, but I'll be corrected if I'm incorrect. Um, have we tried, how good is transcribers for printed text with manuscript annotations? Um, I don't think that'll have come up with the material that Chris and Abriella have been working on, but I do remember trying it with some Bentham material quite early on in the project and the answer was not very well at all. Um, I suspect that was more to do with Bentham's handwriting than the, the technology. Um, and then things may have developed because that would have been a few years ago now. Um, and uh, you know, this third question for training, can I use hand transcribed pages or should they have been recognized by, by transcribers and set to ground truth to be used as epochs um, in the training process? I'm not sure, to be honest. I think, again, that might be another question for um, the transcribers folk themselves. Yeah, I don't understand the, the question. Yeah, we'll, um, we'll, we'll have a word with um, our, our friends in Innsbruck and see if we can figure that out. Um, question from James Freeman. Can you create custom tags if you want to categorize certain words according to criteria that you define so you could tag Augustine and Aldhelm as saints? Again, I'm not sure if it has that level of tagging capabilities um, but I'll, again, I'm going to just, um, yeah i mean this um looking at the list of tags you have um, address abbreviations additions blackenings comments dates um, division gaps organizations persons place um, misspelled words speech supplied words unclear and work so i guess you could use the person that would be in kind of intended use for the person tag but there isn't i don't believe there's currently an option to add custom tags but i may be wrong it may be um located elsewhere but yeah it's just that set but I, maybe you could repurpose the, the the person tag for that yeah so we'll use it as an analog for, for that mm -hmm. right, thank you um another question from yelda in terms of the resolution of images when requesting new photography do you have any recommendations um I think as long as it's a relatively high resolution JPEG, we don't have to go the full hog with with TIFFs, I think. Um, and Transcribus has a, an associated app called DocScan and a scan tent where you can use your, your mobile phone to scan manuscripts, which upload automatically into Transcribus. So I think as long as it's of that, and, and, that, and that quality for a mobile phone is, is sufficient. Um, so yeah, as long as it's relatively high resolution, then you'll be you'll be fine. But obviously, the the, the greater quality of the image, the the better quality results you'll get for your um, HTR uh, experimentation. Um, a question from Christoph Walter: How do you deal with varying orthographical variants of a word on a text, like ratio and ratio, or fakire and fakire, used alongside one another? Um, 
Transcribus there has a, a couple of, of features that help with that. It treats I and J and U and V uh, agnostically. It, it, uh, you can have either one uh, in the, the text and, and it will uh, it will trans transcribe that the way you told it to in the, the ground truth. Uh, for words like uh, ratio with a, a C or with a T, it will treat that as two different words. Uh, so if you're trying to produce a consistent edition, there, you're going to need to do some editing of the text after Transcribus has been through it. Um, what is the, so this is from G Minshall, um, what is the minimum ideal number of images, lines, words to create a, a, a working model? I think Chris might be able to help with that. Um, Perhaps around, perhaps around over a hundred, hundred pages would be would be perfect. You can give it a go with, with with fewer. Um, you could give it a go with twenty. You might not get amazing results when you come to apply it to, to additional material. But it would certainly work and give you a, a bit of a guide. But yeah, we um, when we initially started, we kind of um, aimed towards a hundred, and then eventually got to um, around two hundred or three hundred. But um, so yeah, not not too many, but a fair a fair number. Um, question from Joanna Story. Uh, how well does the tool deal with different hands at work on the same page, i.e. can a model learn more than one hand at work in a collection? Um, yes, I think is the answer. Um, and, and that's how if, yeah, if the hands are, are relatively similar, uh, the, it seems to be able to handle that. We had a, a number of different hands in some of the cartularies just as long as the, the, the script is, is kind of roughly from the same era, uh, it, it can work. Uh, if the, the script becomes, if it, the hands are wildly different, you might have to have to treat the different hands as different manuscripts. Thank you. Um, question from Michael Engel. Um, is this applicable to any languages other than Latin now or in the future, e.g. Hebrew? Um, yes. I think transcribers can now deal with um, languages not written in Latin characters. It can deal with Arabic as well as Hebrew. And I think they're doing experiments with Sanskrit and Japanese um, and ancient Greek. So yeah, yeah. The, the, as, as long as you train the model sufficiently, it, it should um, do the business. I think just looking at the list of available, like publicly available models, there'd be more from other projects that haven't yet made them made them public. But um, I can see this one for Hebrew script, him Hebrew scripts, and Hebrew and Yiddish. Um, so yeah, there are certainly people um, using transcribers for that, and so it's worth having a look at. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, question from Kendall Bittner. Um, I'm struggling to fathom how one might handle multilingual text in the platform. Um, is this possible? So I presume this is this is more than one language on the same document. Which have you come across that in the Latin in, in the material that you were working on? I presume not. Not not in the material we've been working on for this model. I think I think we particularly chose these cartularies because they were exclusively in Latin. Um, I don't know if either of you have, have attempted multilingual manuscripts. We, we have I mean, some, of the, some of Bentham's manuscripts you could find English, French, ancient Greek or Latin on them, um, but we've not specifically done any experiments, but that's perhaps something we could try in the future because yeah, it, it does seem counterintuitive how, how you would if you have a Latin model, but there's also a bit of Greek on the page, how you would reconcile that. I suspect you would have to go with the the model that Stephen with the majority in which the, the page has been written and then and then resolve the the other language there, which is not that satisfactory, but I think that'd be the, the, the way to, to go. Um, question from Alan Hume. Does the format and phrasing in Latin documents follow the repetitiveness of more recent documents? Um, I'm not sure I follow that one. Um, but I think that, for instance, we've, sorry, Alan, if you 
Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that Latin charters often have uh, a lot of phrases that are, are quite similar to each other, um, which probably helped a lot with our model. Um, uh, although each charter has, has very small variations, which is what the, the deeds project is about. It, uh, uh, it's a, a database that, that can date undated charters based on, on little patterns of, of two words beside each other. Um, so, so yes, the, the, the medieval Latin charters are quite repetitive, but there are small variations as well. Thank you, thank you, Alan, for that. Um, one from Archival and Special Collections. Does Transcribus impose a maximum file size for uploading docs? They've got some high resolution TIFFs and they're very large. I'll say that's from Melissa, thank you. Um, would it be better to upload JPEG derivatives? Um, I think there's an FP, FTP way of uploading images to Transcribus. Um, I'm not sure if there is a limit. That's something I'll check. But I, I think that the JPEG derivatives would be sufficient because that's certainly what we used with um, the Bentham manuscripts. Was it JPEGs you were using for the Latin material, Chris? Um, I think the original the original material was were, were JPEGs, but obviously it wasn't it wasn't me that uploaded them. It was it was Hannah. But the later okay. um, some later material was um, I believe it was also JPEGs, but they were rather pixelated. So we um, kind of kind of plan B. It wasn't because they were JPEGs. It was kind of because they were low quality. Um, and then later got some um, really high quality TIFF files for um, a very large size. I don't think there's a um, sort of a file size cap. There's nothing mentioned uh, when you do the go onto the document upload ingest panel, uh, nor is there on um, the wiki as far as a quick search is enough to show. Um, so, no, I don't think there's a, an open limit for the file size. So, the, the, the best you have that you can. So, it might be worth having a go with the, the tips and seeing if it, if it takes. Uh, brilliant, thank you. Um, Couple more questions from Jan. Um, if something is tracked, if sorry, excuse me, tongue tied there. If something is tagged as abbreviation in Transcribus, how does it change Transcribus's behaviour? So, when this is how, how how does Transcribus recognise these um, abbreviations? I mean, it's uh, um, a little bit complicated. I'm not sure. I do a great job of it, so you might have to be more of a confused programmer than I actually am, but. Um, kind of as is, it would it would just if your original ground truth contains plenty of abbreviations, when it when it then um, generates kind of HTML generated text when you when you run it, it would just do it as is you know, as the original abbreviations are read on the page. So if the contracted version of the original abbreviation appears again, it will um, try more or less successfully to, to to replicate that. And then um, having tagged it in your uh, in the text in the bottom page you can identify kind of where it is and then when you go through to to produce a text or, or do whatever you, you want to do with it then you can kind of go through and expand those things underneath that makes sense um, and another question from Jan um, have we have we shared somewhere something like um, a sample page of manuscript showing the, the transcription that we did the transcription done by transcribus and the page after post-processing, so I presume this is sort of a step-by-step sort of -step comparison. I don't think that's been done yet, but it might be in the pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually something we've been talking about. We've actually been talking about going through uh, our results from the latest model systematically and seeing if there are ways that Transcribus consistently uh, misunderstands the, the transcription we put into it and whether there's uh, there are any ways we should change our transcription uh, practices for the sake of the software uh, so that it, we get better results. Perfect, thank you. Um, and a question from Michael here. Uh, any tips concerning cost calculations? I think this might be in reference to the uh, transcribers credits. Now, Chris will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you get 500 free as a an individual who signs up. Um, and then there are concessions and exceptions for uh, students and research projects. So it's probably worth um, checking the Transcribus website about, um, about that. So you, 
sort of more you're getting into um, before embarking on a, on a major um, HTR project. Yeah, as I mentioned, so the, the credits page on the Chinscoe's website gives kind of a rough outline in terms of the number of pages you can process um, with a X number of credits, depending on whether you want to use HTR, which is what we've used, or, or PyLayer, which I mentioned in passing. And, and then that should uh, allow you to come up with some kind of calculation of how many you might need, depending on how many pages you're going to look at for your, your project. Thank you all for those questions. I think we've, uh, oh, there's another one from uh, Melissa. Sorry, is it possible to share transcripts in Model 7 via downloads or other distribution methods? Um, I think if, the, so if, if um, you use Model 7, you see on Toronto Model 7 to produce transcripts of material, yes, you can then export it in the various formats I mean, that, that Chris um, described. So yes, you should be able to um, do that and then share them as you as you please. Yeah, unless you specifically meant, um, am I able to share some of the transcripts that are seventh model and generators with you? Then um, yes, yeah, so no problem. If you um, if you'd like to email me, I can I can do that. Right. Yeah. So sorry, I misunderstood. I know, oh, it's just, just in case, just in case that was just looking oh, great. No worries. Brilliant. Okay. Unless there are any more questions coming through, which I don't think there are, I will um, thank Chris and Ariella for their time and explaining this stuff that I've, I've, uh, I've worked on this some of this years ago and I've, I've forgotten more than I can remember. So it's Chris is the, the real expert here at the Bentham Project and um, it, it's it's great to see so many of you here and I hope you may find this this model useful. Um, so yes, thank you Chris, thank you Ariella and particular thanks to the um, UCL uh, Toronto call for Joint Research Projects and Exchange Activities Programme which uh, funded this research and we're, we're very grateful for that and for, for being able to work with Michael and his team and <coughs> so it's been a real pleasure and we'll, not, we'll see where this, this takes us next. Yeah, thank you Tim. So thank you and um, with that we'll say uh, good evening from here in London and um, yeah if, if you do have any further queries do just uh, drop us online and uh, we'll help as, we, as, as and when we can. So thank you and uh, good evening from here.